In previous days, Sayadawji spoke about the five ruling faculties, the governing powers which can keep one from making mistakes. And if one, if individuals are able to control themselves, then the problems that exist in the world would, would come to an end. When people aren't able to control themselves, aren't even able to rule or master themselves, and although they're leaders, they uh, do not study how to govern, or they study but don't apply correct methods, then because of these conditions, the world is seething, boiling with problems, and individuals don't get along with each other. So the Buddha spoke about moral shame and moral fear, hiri and otapa, out of, out of shame and fear regarding unwholesomeness, one controls oneself. And as a result, one doesn't harm others. Or one has the ability to understand how other people feel. And out of that understanding, one refrains from harming others and therefore doesn't make mistakes oneself. So if one practices the Dhamma of Satipatthana, then these ruling powers which were originally present in the individual become amazingly strong. One has to, uh, one has to understand, have faith, that all things which arise in oneself come to an end. And one has to work respectfully to bring about seeing it. <clears throat> one has to work continuously in the practice and one needs to have seven suitable things, seven types of suitability to rely on. And out of the nine causes for sharpening the ruling, the ruling faculties, these five dhammas, four factors have been spoken about. And today, Sayadawji will begin by explaining the fifth. So one needs to, first of all, establish sila, morality. And this means that our physical and verbal behavior will be clean. And one also has to have moral shame and moral fear, hiri and notapa. So this morality is our foundation. It's just the base, though. It's just the foundation. And uh, like a foundation of a building, there's more that needs to be, uh, be put there. But it is very important, although it is just the foundation, it is very important that this foundation be firm. Because as in a building, if the foundation is not strong and firm and properly laid, then the building will quickly come to ruin. So in one's life, in living a clean and wholesome life, one must understand what are the things which cause one trouble, which which make it difficult to live a clean life. And these are wanting, desire, just on an ordinary level, and then extreme selfishness, wanting for oneself in an extreme way. There's ordinary <coughs> anger, <coughs> resentment, bearing grudges, and then there's extreme anger, cruelty, hatred, 
and there's not knowing not knowing the that uh, not knowing that these things are wrong being confused being ignorant so these three dhammas are the roots of all akusala consciousness of all unwholesome mentality and if they if one accepts them then what will happen is that there will be unwholesomeness sometimes if one if one accepts the times greed greed will become extreme and then one will commit unwholesome acts based on this or there will be anger the anger will become extreme and based on this one will commit unwholesomeness there will be a kusla or our ignorance confusion delusion will be extreme and based on not knowing this one will commit unwholesome acts this is evident in the world no one can deny that this is so just take a look at your own life from the time you were young up until older years how were you when you were young so if you can calculate look at your own self development and calculate you will know about your own life so if the if these unwholesome factors are not uprooted then one has to find a way so what is the way to make ourselves what is the clean way what is the what is the true way to uproot the kilesas so one has to search for a teacher who can teach this and it's not enough just to have theoretical knowledge one has to have practical knowledge one also must go to search for someone that has loving kindness and compassion so in searching uh, there are qualities that such a correct teacher has and there are seven that the buddha described to be a good person seven qualities are needed the first is pia pia means to be lovable one keeps the five precepts for monks they keep their sila so one keeps one's respective morality clean one's physical and verbal behavior is clean and this makes one lovable pia so one one who has this cleanliness becomes lovable and this lovable quality is called pia the second quality one sila one has good sila and one keeps one's mind it one is able to control one's mind and one has developed knowledge one is really able to help others in their search for truth and they do so without expectation for themselves this type of person is respectable and this quality is called guru so with such a person is worthy of 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 one's respect such a person is respected when sila and samadhi and panya morality concentration and wisdom are all combined in a person then such a person can be a true refuge for others and other people uh because of the qualities that the that this person has that person receives their students loving kindness 
their students feel loving kindness for, for their teacher because of their sila, samadhi, and panya. And uh, one, the students also, they don't want that person to suffer. And they rejoice in the good qualities, the, whole, the successes of the teacher. So the, such a person, person is such a person who receives other people's loving kindness, who receives their uh, compassion, their, their sympathetic joy. This is called bhavaniya. So one who is, um, one who has studied and practiced as well, and is fulfilled with sila, samadhi, and panya, they are able to speak for the benefit of their students. They're not hesitant to point out, to say what needs to be said to the students so that the students can progress. And the teacher who can, the person who can speak in this way is called vata, this quality of being able to tell the, tell the students what they need to hear, whether it's, uh, whether it's pleasant or not. So um, that is the f that is another quality, vata. And another quality is now some people think that only uh, only those who are very high can correct them. Some people think like that. But when other people see us, they may see something wrong. And in all good faith, they may point that out. So one should accept criticism openly. One should not have any pride when, other, when others point out one's fault, faults. One should not re respond with pride, but should accept the criticism, listen to it. And this ability to be patient to bear the criticism of others is called vasanakama. That means that they can, um, they can <clears throat> when other people point out their faults, they don't react with pride. They, they listen. <clears throat> this quality is very much lacking in the world. The sixth quality is gambharancha katankata. This means <clears throat> that one is the one has studied and as well as practiced the Dhamma, the profound Dhamma, and therefore one is able to speak about it. One is able to speak about topics such as Satipatthana, the four foundations of mindfulness, or the four noble truths, or how due to causes effects come about, the cause and effect relationships of mind and matter. And the person is able to speak about this deep, profound Dhamma without expectation of glory, without expectation of fame, or of receiving gifts. The final quality is nojatana tane niyozako. That means that a person does not use one's students for one's own benefit. One doesn't look and see, oh, you know, uh, how can I, uh, if this person does this for me or that for me, they don't, uh, they don't use their students in an improper way for their own benefit. So a person who is fulfilled with these seven qualities is called a Kalyana Mita, the best of friends, the good teacher. And it is very important to be able to choose a teacher based on these seven qualities. In the world, there are many people who teach meditation and there are many who go the wrong way. 
So if one is going to be a teacher, one needs to, first of all, fulfill oneself by practice. Then one also needs to study, be able to explain to others about the practice, about the Dhamma. One needs to keep one's physical, verbal, and mental behavior clean, as according to the Dhamma, really clean, not just pretending. So this type of teacher is very important. The Buddha taught for beings so that they would not suffer, and he taught not out of his imagination, but out of what he knew. So, with the practice of Satipatthana, he eliminated the gross, the medium, and the refined levels of defilements, kilesas, with the realization of the path of arahantship. Among the kilesas, moha, not knowing, or knowing in the wrong way. This was included in what was eliminated. So because of this, whatever he put his mind on, he was able to know. There was no obstacle to his knowledge, to his ability to know. And only after this knowledge arose did he preach how to how to become clean? Did he preach the practice? He didn't, did he, only after this knowledge arose, did he preach what he came to know with this knowledge. He didn't speak out of his imagination. Some people, scientists, theoreticians, in Sayadawji uh, said that the Buddha didn't speak in the way of a theoretician. Uh, he, he wasn't like that. He practiced, he, pro, he preached what he actually knew to be true. So it is said in the Pali, Buddha, So Bhagawa, Buddhaya Dhammande Seti. Buddha means that. This is the person who 2,500 years ago became enlightened. He came to know the Four Noble Truths, the truth of suffering, the truth of its cause, the truth of the cessation of suffering, and the truth of the path to it. He came to know this, so he was called Buddha. And only after knowing like this for himself did he teach so that others too could know Buddhaya. This was his objective. If, if the beings don't know this method, if they don't know the Dhamma, then they will suffer. So may they know. He didn't teach because he wanted others to revere him or worship him. He didn't teach because he wanted material gifts. His objective was very clean. With regard to uprightness, there is no one who could compare to him. And therefore, humans and celestial beings all surrounded him and paid respects. So if one is free, of any crookedness, then one is then one is bound to always have enough to eat. One is always going to be trusted by people. Sorry. So one who is upright is able to admit one's faults, is able to admit what one has done wrong, and is able to correct oneself. So the Buddha, what the Buddha said was 
was connected with knowledge. So when we say what we think, but don't really know, then true nature's unclear and doubts appear. When people say what is just based on imagination, but not based on reality, not based on what is directly obser observable, what they, what they say is not true nature. And when people hear this, because it's not based on truth, doubts arise in the mind of the listener. Hear, the hearer, hearers doubt when what they hear is not based on truth. But on the other hand, when, what, when one says what we, one sees and really knows, then true nature is clear and doubts are cleared. So one has to see what one really, one has to say what one really sees and knows. Knowledge must be involved. And then what one says will be very clear. So the Buddha himself, the way he taught was very clear. He himself gained the Dhamma and he was completely, uh, he had full faith. This is how, and he pointed out this path of this practice of Satipatthana. He instructed how to follow it. And yogis, when they report, yogis, when they practice, they put the instructions into practice. When they say what they experience, what they really come to see, they can speak very clearly. What, they can say very clearly what they have observed because it is truly done, truly known through the practice. And this is the Buddha's way. Like this, when one observes the mind and matter that are related as cause and effect, when one applies effort and aiming, then uh, one does this so that sati will stick firmly to the object. And when sati is able to stick firmly, then the mind will not scatter. The mind will not scatter. And so, therefore, the mind will become collected. And this collectedness is called samadhi, or samatha. Samatha means to calm the navaranas, the obstacles to kusala, the obstacles to wholesomeness and to concentration, the dhammas which prevent our mind from being clean and which we can knowledge. Samadhi, or samatha, cleans the mind of these qualities. So this must be strong, the samadhi. So the yogis, in whatever posture they may be, whether sitting, standing, walking, lying down, they observe the arising object applying ardent effort and accurate aim. And if one does like that, when the aim is accurate, aiming, then sati will not miss. Sati will stick with the object, and therefore samadhi will arise, collectedness of mind. So we observe so that our samadhi will be good. There are three kinds of samadhi explained in the text. The first is kanika samadhi. The second is upachara samadhi. And the third is apana samadhi. And Sieroji will explain these one by one. Among these three, when we put our mind onto the arising mind and matter, the arising action. For example, if we speak in terms of the actions on which we focus, 
putting our mind on bending, stretching, lifting, moving, placing, rising, falling, and so on. Or in terms of dhammas or net qualities, if we put our mind on things like uh, forgetting, unclarity, heat, cold, thinking, planning, and so on. These are all qualities or, or dhammas. And one has to observe these as they are. So the kanika samadhi is focusing on these actions or these qualities one by one. So when one applies effort, ardent effort and aiming to observe the arising mind and matter at the very moment it occurs, then sati follows and the mind becomes collected. And this collectedness of mind is called kanika samadhi or momentary concentration. So the yogis now are gathering, collecting this kanika samadhi, momentary concentration. And when one collects enough so that one is able to discern, see the difference between mind and matter, or nama and rupa, then this is, um, this is at the level of basic upachara samadhi. So people who observe, uh, people who develop the worldly jhanas, they also put their minds uh, they use their minds to focus. They put their minds on them, on themselves and focus. And after developing this upachara samadhi, then jhanic, the samadhi concentration of absorption arises. But here, the yogis are, who are practicing develop kanika samadhi. So, as well as so there are these three, kanika samadhi and then upachara samadhi, which is the, the uh, precursor, what comes before the absorption samadhi and apana samadhi. So there are these three kinds of samadhi. So people who are meditating now are not working to develop jhanak samadhi, apana samadhi, but <clears throat> are working to develop kanika samadhi. So this kanika samadhi is what is able to fall, fall on the arising object in our mind and body moment after moment, no matter what the object is. The samadhi of, of jhana is focused on a conceptual object. It is not focused on ultimate reality. It is not focused on something real. Here, we have to watch the, what arises in us moment by moment. And what is needed for that is kanika samadhi. So this is how these two types of concentration are different. The Buddha called this type of samadhi kanika cheteka, cheteka kanika chitta ekagata. Kanika means the mind and matter which arise moment by moment due to causes. Seeing, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, lifting, moving, placing and so on, all these arise and then pass away immediately. And that is why they are called kanika, or momentary. So, while they arise, moment by moment, the mind falls collectively on that, on that momentary thing. And this falling collectively of the mind is samadhi. So it is called kanika cheteka gata, this, the mind being one-pointed 
moment by moment. So this, my, this sam, samadhi or concentration is established moment by moment on the object and it is called kanika samadhi. So we put our mind on the abdomen and the abdomen rises. We put our mind on the abdomen, the abdomen, the falling arises. So these, the names for what happens there are rising and falling. But this is just, uh, in terms of true nature, it is things like stiffness or tension or relaxation or movement, tightness. So this is the air element occurring. The air element is something which is really there. And when this arises one after another, the mind falls collectively on this. So the mind, when the rising occurs, the mind falls collectively on the rising. When the falling occurs, the mind falls collectively on the falling. When there's bending, the mind falls collectively on the bending. When there's uh, lifting, the mind falls collectively on the lifting. When there's placing, the mind falls collectively on the placing. Today, Sayadawji saw a yogi who was walking, and as the yogi walked, he or she uh, lifted the head up and then looked to the left and looked to the right. And such a yogi uh, is not practicing respectfully. The, such a yogi is not going to gain the Dhamma in, by practicing in this way. So when one makes a step with the foot, one has to put the mind on that foot. And if one instead, while one walks, one lifts up one head, one's head, one looks to the left, one looks here, one looks there. Uh, yogis should not do like this. This is not a correct practice. This is not respectful. So kanika samadhi is collectedness of mind that is the same moment after moment, although the objects differ. For the rising and the falling are different, but the samadhi that falls, the mind falling on those objects is the same. Lifting, moving, and placing, these are different. But these are all real things. And because one applies effort and aiming, one is able to observe them. Sati arises and the mind falls collectively on the object. So at that moment, the, uh, the obstacle of sense desire, kama chanda nivarana, does not arise. There's no wanting to see, hear good things, see good things, hear good things, smell, taste, touch good things. And the obstacle of dissatisfaction, dosa, this does not arise. Instead, the mind is falling collectively on the object. So there's no scattered mind, there's no worry that can arise. And the mind, the mind is focused accurately on the object, so there's no sloth and torpor, no laziness enters the mind. And also because the aim is accurate, then that one is connecting accurately with the object, then there's no doubt about one, what one is observing there. There's no wavering. So all the obstacles to concentration, the nivaranas, are being eliminated. And in the next moment of observation, they're eliminated again and again. So the, as one Established, establishes this uh, collected mind, 
time and again on the object, whatever the ob arising object is, the nivaranas, the obstacles to concentration, become very far distanced from one's mind. So the mind is quite clean. One has to collect kanika samadhi in this way. This is very important. And if yogis work respectfully, then the mind becomes clean and the yogis feel quite good and happy. So at those times, one has to remember how one got to that situation so that when one encounters difficulties at another time, one can apply the method that one knows for concentrating one's mind. <laughs>